this last series, this last sermon in, in our series about changing my mind. Um, our souls have been changed by Jesus. But I don't know about you, but our flesh constantly battles against us. And this battle takes place in our minds. So please would you open your scriptures with me this morning. Are you going to get tired of me asking you to do this? But I'm going to continue until I can see everybody got a scripture in front of them. Either the paper scripture or your smartphone or your Bible app or whatever you've got. And please go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 2. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians. So it's that book that we are looking at, Acts and Corinthians, chapter 2. And I'm going to read the whole chapter to you. Uh, it sounds long, but it's not. It's only 16 verses. And as I'm reading, either whatever you're writing with, whatever you're writing on, um, try and pick out for me two words that Paul keeps on repeating in this chapter. Um, yes, there are three letter words that come often. I'm not asking for that. I'm asking for a word that's got more than three letters. Um, and when we get to the end, let's see. Let's see if you pass the test and uh, we'll all get a distinction today, I'm sure. So I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In my Bible, I headed it, and it's headed Christ crucified, and next to it I wrote the Christian message for me. The Christian message for me. I also wrote in the margin, it's important to know the crucified Jesus. Not to know about him, but to know him. So Paul writes and says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom amongst those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak of the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But it is written, eye has not seen and ear not heard, nor, have ent nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, deep things of God. For what man knows the things, for what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that we have been free, that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which, man was, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he might instruct him? But we 
have the mind of Christ. Anybody pick up those two words that I keep on looking at? Wisdom, well done. Who said that? There you go. And spirit. Wisdom and spirit. The word wisdom is repeated 14 times in my version of the scripture. And the word spirit, either with a capital letter or with a small letter, or spiritual things is repeated 13 times in this chapter. And so I can make the deduction that this chapter is about spiritual wisdom. It's not about my own wisdom. The title of my sermon this morning is called Foolish Thinking and Wise Thinking. And I guess we all want to choose the wise thinking. When I put them together, I realize that spiritual wisdom is the wisdom which comes from the Holy Spirit, from God's Spirit. And that's what I'm going to be speaking about this morning. Scripture shows us that there's a difference between thinking God's way and thinking my way. Was it old blue eyes who said, I'll do it my way? He got it wrong. He got it wrong. There's such a contrast between God's way and my way. Please don't close your scriptures. I I want you to keep them there because I'm going to keep on going back to verses and just highlighting a couple of things uh, from the verses. And I want you to see them. The day when we do not preach the word of God from this pulpit is the day you must change and go to another church, please. A church that does. Because this is the important. Not my thinking. If you've come here to hear what I'm thinking about this, you got it wrong, eh? See, if I look at, at the foolish thinking first... One of the first ways I I use my own mind to think about things is I live my life to impress other people. And Paul speaks about this in 1 Corinthians 2.1 where he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. It was not Paul's thinking. But it is rather what the Holy Spirit was teaching him. I think one of the biggest curses in life today is living to impress other people. We all want to know what other people think about us. We all want to know if we dressed okay or if we're looking okay. We're constantly drawing attention to ourselves, what I have and what I haven't got. And and Paul says the exact opposite is what impresses God. Not when I'm trying to draw attention to myself, but when I'm drawing attention to Christ. And, And that is why I wrote in the margin of my Bible, it's important to know Christ. It's important to know the crucified Christ. So in verse 1 I see that Paul is saying, I've not come to impress you with who I am. I've come to impress upon you the love of God. In verses 2 and 3, Paul says that so often we pretend to be strong. Let's read them. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. How could Paul, this incredible man of God, be scared? How could he stand when he was preaching Christ crucified and tremble from fear? But he did. But what do we do? 
We want to impress people by pretending to be strong. We want uh, people to see that we are capable of doing all things. Does next what for our hand if it staan in there? No. That's not what we're called to do. We are called to come before the Lord with fear and trembling. Please don't try and be somebody you're not. Just be the person that you are. Be the person that God has called you to be. Look to Jesus. You want to see a strong person? Then see Jesus in that person. Because that's who, make them str- who makes them strong. You see, we wrongfully say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, because we don't finish the verse. Yes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not in my own strength. In verses 4 and 5, Paul tells us that our walk must be our talk. And not just our talk. Because so often we talk beyond our own actuality. I don't know how often you hear people just exaggerating things around you. Where we try and be people that we're not to be. Listen to what Paul says in verses 4 and 5. He says, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of a human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. A few weeks ago I spoke about the fact that there's so many theories and doctrines and everything going around, and we have the prosperity theology and we have this theology and we have that theology and we hook on to them because they sound so convincing but what is God's message to us today don't rest in the wisdom of God uh, of man but rest in the power of God if I skip a few verses and go to verse 14, I realize that we resist God's truth. We reject God's truth. Verse 14, Paul says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are not spiritually discerned. Don't push back the power of God in your life. We reject the truth of God and hold on to the wisdom of man. The foolish person is so focused on the wisdom of this world, which is pride and power, that we have no room to accept the truth from God. The three most powerful things in this world at the moment are money, sex, and power, because they all bring about the spirit of pride in our lives. We say, we don't really need God to tell me what to do. I know what I should be doing. And so we reject God's warnings when they come. We we convince ourselves that we know more and that we know best. And we reject the truth and even ignore the truth of God. The things of God are folly to a fool. I read this in verse 14, but I also read it in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. It's just a page back where it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved... It is the power of God. 
there's so many ideologies at the moment trying to disprove the birth, the death, the resurrection, and ascension of God. The word folly in the Greek is maria, which means madness or silliness. The gospel of Christ is madness to those who reject God. The gospel of Christ is madness to those who will not see the power of the cross. When, when this was first explained to the Greek believers by people like John Mark of Jerusalem, who spoke specifically to the Greek-speaking people. And he told them that there was this man who was taken and put to death on a piece of wood, put on a hill in a little town that nobody even knew, at a crossroad that nobody could even identify it. They couldn't accept it. They didn't want to accept that. Because that's foolish. Why would a man be put to death on a piece of wood? But you know what? Their eternity hangs in the balance. And it hangs in the balance because we are so filled with pride and with power that we find it very difficult to accept that the Savior of this world was prepared to go to the cross. It's very difficult to convince people it was very difficult for the early Christians to convince, convince the Greeks in those days. But maybe if we took people with us to Calvary, they wouldn't feel sorry for Jesus. They wouldn't just give him lip service. Maybe they would give him their lives. At the end of the day, that is what the Christian gospel is all about. To see Christ and see him crucified for us. What then is wise thinking? I find the first one in verse 5 again. Where Paul writes and says that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of of God, wise thinking is dying to self. It's not about me. It's not about what I can do. It's not about all my gifts and my talents and everything else. I went to the EMSA AGM in Clarksdorp, um, which ended this morning early, but I came back yesterday because I wanted to be here this morning. And you, you wear, those of us who have done Emmaus will know that you wear your name tag so that everybody knows who you are and they can call you by name. And uh, I put my name tag around my neck and this one man walked up to me and he said, oh, is that who you are? I said, yes. And the conversation ended right there because I turned around and walked away. But who are you? Who are you when you're alone? Who are you when, when there's nobody watching you? You see, in company, it's all about what I can do and what I can bring to the table. But maybe Jesus says to me, lay that down. Bring me to your table. The second thing that I find changes my way of thinking is when I start centering all on Jesus. When I don't boast in my status or who I am. But rather, I boast in the one who saved me and has given me eternal life. 
because that is the important thing. See, when, when Paul speaks to the people of Philippi, he tells them that their, their good works are rubbish. In, in the Greek language, that's called skubalon, rubbish. Skubalon. If I directly translate skubalon, it actually means dirty nappies. <coughs> That was a sobering thought for me. Isaiah says that my righteousness is as filthy rags in his sight. You see, without Christ, I'm nothing. Without Christ, I'm nothing. In verse 7, if your scriptures are still open, Paul tells us to receive God's truth. He says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of glory. Fools reject God's wisdom. Fools reject this word. They say, how can you believe this when it was written such a long time ago? That there's no documented proof for this. There is. There's more documented proof about the life of Jesus, which we battle to believe, than what there is for Julius Caesar. There's more documented proof about Jesus, but we reject it. God has spoken to us. God, God gives his messages to his servants today. And he asks his servants just to come and serve them. You see, we're not the chefs. We're the waiters. God is the chef. And all he says is, take what I'm giving you and go and feed my people. I loved it when I realized that God is so much greater than what we could ever think or imagine. And then verses 8 to 12 of this passage of scripture is, is how we walk in the spirit with God. And this is the meat of this passage. This is what I need to get my feet, my mouth, my teeth stuck into. Verse 9 is perhaps the most misunderstood verse in this, and we always speak about verse 9 at funeral services. You know, no eye has seen and, and no ear has heard what he has entered into the heart of man, and we say, ah, this is heaven. But look what verse 10 says. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God to us. That verse is not speaking about heaven. That verse is speaking about God revealing the scriptures to us. God opening up the scriptures to us if we would only avail ourselves to understand it. To spend time with God. If, if the only time you open your scriptures is on a Sunday morning here at church, I'm glad you do. But it's more than that. There comes a time when we need to open our scriptures, not just once a day, but as many times as we possibly can. You see, he's given us his spirit to explain the scriptures to us. God will reveal himself to you when you take the time to spend with him. You know what he'll do is he'll change the way you think. We need the Holy Spirit of God so that we can start thinking wisely and thinking clearly. The benefits of walking in the Spirit, of being baptized in the Spirit, of using your prayer language if you've already received one. If you haven't, then we need to pray for you to receive it. Um, the benefit of that is that when we walk with the Spirit, we spend time listening we spend time in the scriptures with a heart that is surrendered. 
If I'm going to spend time listening to God, please, I'm saying this with as much love as I possibly can. You've got to shut your mouth. You've got to start becoming quiet. You can't listen and speak at the same time. Jesus did that. And I read about this in Mark chapter 1, where, where Jesus would take himself away. And Mark chapter 1 is one example. There are so many in the New Testament. When he goes to a lonely place to spend time on his own with God. And we need to do this, the same. Psalm 46, 10. How many can recite that? Come on, I'm challenging you. Study scripture. Be still. And know that I'm God. We need to stop rushing around. If we're going to walk earnestly with God, then we've got to learn to become quiet. We've, we've got to learn to take the time and spend in the scriptures. I've said this how many times now? I just keep on going back to this. I feel like I'm a stuck record at the moment. But when I spend time with God in the scriptures, my relationship with him begins to happen. If I'm just sitting quietly without my scriptures in front of me, I've just got that kind of man in mind. I overthink things and I overplan things and I want everything to be like this. I've already started working on the plan, the preaching series for next year. I'm a little bit late already. I normally do it in October, and we're already in November. But when I sit still with nothing, when I'm just not reading the word, my mind goes all over. But when I discipline my mind to come to the word, when I take a phrase, a word, and I start digging into that word and saying, God, speak to me about this one particular word. Come and tell me about it. Then my listening time with God is with God's word opened. On my lap. Not on my desk. On my lap. And that leads to one thing, and that leads to a heart fully surrendered. And I've got to the place where if I believe Holy Spirit is calling me to do something, I say yes before I even know everything that I need to do. Boy, I get myself into trouble, but that's fine. But my answer to God is yes, not maybe. Yes, I'll obey. Yes, I'll do it today. There's no substitute for this. There's no shortcut. This is not legalistic in any way, but rather it's relational. You see, two great things were, were grace to you when you gave your life to the Lord. The one was the Holy Spirit, and the other was the mind of Christ. And Paul tells us this. He tells us that the same mind that was in Christ, that mind that didn't think evil of any person, is the same mind that God gives to us as a gift. We lack nothing. We lack nothing when we walk in wisdom, when we think rightly, when we think wisely, when we, when we surrender our thought patterns to the Lord to the Holy Spirit. We lack nothing. And this is what God wants us to do. So the two internal things that God has given me are the Holy Spirit and the mind of Christ. The two external things that God has given me is the scripture and you. You grow me. You realize that? We grow each other. We cooperate together. And then we think wisely. I started the series a couple of weeks ago now by saying every step towards godliness and every step towards sin began with a, begins with a thought. And today... 
I want you to think wisely. What have you done in the last 24 hours of your life? How many times have you spoken about God in the last 24 hours? It's unfair, I've just been to the IMSA conference where, where our minds were really focusing on, on God. But what happened yesterday morning, every now and then, just reduces me to tears. Because the Spirit of God is so real. When God touches you, you cannot remain unmoved. I drove home yesterday. We were each given a little teddy bear yesterday with somebody's name on it, somebody who was at the conference. But they didn't know. You don't know whose who's teddy bear your name is on. And we were asked to pray for that person intently. And only today to reveal to that person uh, who you were praying for. Well, I did this morning early. I let my, the person I was praying for know that I've been praying for her and that as I drove home all day yesterday, well, yesterday I was thinking of her and praying just about all the way for her. And it was amazing how when we allow our thoughts to be centered in on God, how he gives you the right things to pray. And when I shared with her what I'd been praying for her for, and I don't know her. I don't know her. She's from Mpumalanga, from Nelspreit. I don't know her. I've never met her. And when I shared with her this morning the things that I've been praying with for her, Yesterday, she said, how did you know? I didn't. But we can expect God to move our prayer life. I also said right in the beginning, and Gail quoted it at me in the last two weeks or so, to, to rather, instead of think, do, think, stop, and then either do or don't do. Because then we start relying on the Spirit of God. When I stop for a moment, just stop and ask God if there's a red light or a green light. If there's a red light, then please take your scriptures and start reading again. Make sure that you hear the word of God. Allow God's word to become your plumb line. I love that word. It's a word that Amos uses all the time in his little um, prophetic book in the Old Testament. He says that the, the plumb line we use is skew. God's plumb line falls dead straight. And my friends, this is his plumb line. Not my own thoughts, but his. Not my will be done, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Last week I referred to, to God as, as being a wrecking ball and sometimes God's word is a mirror, a fire, and a hammer in my life. If we move from think and do to think, stop, and do or don't do, I think the choices we're going to make are going to be so much wiser. And then my prayer today is, Oh God, please help me change my mind. Oh God, please help me change my mind.